Hello and welcome back to our study in the book of Philippians. Uh, hopefully you have a copy of the scriptures with you. Uh, if you don't, you might want to run and grab them real fast. Uh, we're in chapter 4 this week, Philippians chapter 4. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> just to recap, to well, get us up to speed while you're turning there. Uh, recall that Philippians is written by Paul while he is awaiting trial before Caesar. Uh, he has uh, claimed his Roman citizenship and his right to appeal to Caesar uh, after there was a uh, kind of a, a riot with some Jews, and then he was taken uh, by the Roman soldiers and <clears throat> questioned and, and started to be flogged, and, uh, and he appealed uh, his right to Caesar. And so uh, Paul, while he's there, writes several epistles, uh, and Philippians is one of them. <clears throat> and so one of the stunning characteristics about Philippians is it is a letter about uh, joy that Paul pens while in some of the you know, most unfortunate circumstances. <clears throat> and so there's a lot that we can glean out of Philippians that relates to Paul's circumstances and uh, him being able to write a letter uh, that's characterized by joy. <clears throat> uh, so uh, if you recall in verses 1 through 7, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, uh, we talked a lot about finding peace, uh, finding peace with people that we struggle with. If you recall the uh, the the issues between Yodia and Syntyche uh, back up in uh, verse 2, <clears throat> and how these women needed to find unity, and they needed to live together in harmony, uh, even though there, there was something, something amiss there, and he calls the church to, to be there for them and to encourage them in that. <clears throat> and then also, our ability to deal uh, with worry and, and circumstances and life that's coming at us. Uh, so hopefully those uh, uh, ring true or kind of ring to your remembrance as we uh, start in our study today. Uh, okay, I want to read uh, 1 through 9. Really, we're just covering verses 8 and 9 today, just two verses. So we're not going to try and tackle a whole lot as far as text goes, uh, but there's, uh, I think, a really important point here for understanding how to achieve this joy that Paul has and this peace that he's been talking about. Uh, so I want to read 1 through 9, get us in our context. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, so stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Iodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true comrade, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. All right, uh, so when you, when you consider our day and age, you know, as Paul writes this, and obviously verses 8 and 9 uh, are really focused on where are we devoting our mental uh, attention? Where are we giving our time? And far more each generation, but I think just in, in just almost an exponential growth we've seen in the last couple generations, the opportunity to fill your mind uh, with various things and almost the art of, of being at rest and being quiet and the the art of meditation, uh, not like an Eastern meditation, but just a, a calming of your mind and focusing on Scripture and letting it fill your mind. Like these practices have been lost because we've been so consumed with information, information, information. And you know as well as I do, <laughs> not all that information is good. Like we, we are exposed either willingly or unwillingly almost all day long to 
bad information and good information. And then we're left to figure this whole system out and decipher it all. We live in a very fast paced society. Uh, we're constantly being uh, inundated with uh, video streams and, and audio and video and everything is happening around us. And we really, <clears throat> like if you, if you find yourself with more than 30 seconds of downtime, uh, if you just stand in the grocery line at Walmart for more than 30 seconds, like immediately our phones are out. We're finding something to do. We're scrolling social media. Uh, we're playing Sudoku. Uh, maybe we're just, who knows what we're doing? Sometimes just nothing. We just feel that we're productive if we just have some type of information coming across our eyes. We have 24 hour a day access uh, to news, uh, to, to live streams from all around the world. Um, we just we live in a very fast paced information inundated society. Uh, and the question is, like, how does this affect us? How does this impact us as Christians? Is it helping us? Or is it hurting us? And maybe the answer is both. And we need to figure out like how it's helping us and how it's hurting us. Uh, before we get into our text, I just want to want you to think about three principles on uh, our thinking. Uh, number one, the things that you fill your mind with today are going to be the things that you think about tomorrow. The things you think about or fill your mind with today are the things that you'll be thinking about tomorrow. The people that in your life, the people you surround yourself with are who you become. If you surround yourself uh, you know, with, with criminals and thugs, then you're most likely going to be a criminal or a thug. If you surround yourself with spiritual, godly, giving people, you're probably going to be a, a spiritual, godly, giving person. We just, we rise to the standards or lower ourselves to the standards of the people that we surround ourselves with. And so the things that we're filling our mind with are changing our future. They're changing our path. They're determining tomorrow, who we're going to be tomorrow. It's just this, a simple rule of influence. What you surround yourself with or who you surround yourself with is what you will become in life. So, number one, the things that you fill your mind with today are the things that you'll think about tomorrow. Number two, our behavior is built off of the things that we think about. Right? Our behavior is built off of the things that we think about. Uh, you've heard, heard the old phrase, uh, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, you know, it's what are we filling our minds with? That's going to be the tools that we're providing our mind and our, our body to react to situations uh, that, that come across us. All right, so if, if I watch a, a lot of movies and I hang out with uh, a lot of movies that are like very violent and I hang out with a lot of angry people and I surround myself all the time with this kind of anger and violence. When something happens to me, somebody cuts me off in traffic, how am I going to respond? Well, there's not necessarily a direct equation in all of this, but the tools that I've given my mind and my heart are anger and violence. Now, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that if you just, you know, play one violent video game that you know you're you're doomed to this life of, of violence. But I'm asking, what is your mental and spiritual diet? What are we taking in into our minds? Because that is being reflected into our actions. And so it's it's kind of like, you know, you are what you eat. Well, it's the same thing. You are what you think. Uh, in <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says this in, in in regards to how our our minds and our actions relate. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay, so he's saying don't be conformed. Look at the action, right? Careful who you're conforming to, not to the world. We're conforming to Christ, right? And 
Then at the end of the verse, and we'll pick up the middle in a second, at the end, he says, prove what the will of God is. How are you going to prove what the will of God is in your life? Well, it's going to be reflected by your actions. And so whether we're determining what we're being conformed to or what we're proving with our lives, it all comes back to this transformation that's happening in our mind. That's how we change our conformity from the world to Christ. And that's how we prove what the will of God is, by transforming or being transformed by the renewing of our mind. If we're just filling our mind with the constant same old junk from the world, is it going to be any shock that our actions are going to be the same old junk that the world produces? But if our mind is being transformed and changed into a spiritual powerhouse, well, is it going to be any shock that we ex exemplify the characteristics of God in our daily life? So your behavior is built off of the things that you think about. And then number three, <clears throat> you can control what you think about. You can control what you think about. Now, there's a difference in thinking of something and thinking on something, right? Right? You can think of things all day long, and really, you can't necessarily control what you think of. Sometimes, thoughts are just popping in your head. You see a billboard. Right? So you hear overhear a conversation of somebody else that you're walking by. It could be any number of sorts of things that you can't necessarily control what you think of, but you can determine what you do from that point. I might think of something, you know, angry or bitter to say to somebody, but I can choose what to do with that thought. I can choose whether I think on that thought. So I might think of it, and I don't necessarily control that, but I do get to control whether I think on that thought. Where do I put my mind? I can't just keep things from popping in my head, but I can decide if I'm going to camp out on them. I don't know if you remember the, the quote by Martin Luther. Uh, he said, you can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Now, things are going to come into our minds and in our lives, and we can't always control that. But we do control what stays in our hearts and what stays in our minds, what we continue to dwell on. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, Paul says this, We are destroying speculation and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Did you hear that? Like, like imagine this scenario in, in your mind that you are taking every thought captive captive to the obedience of Christ. And so a thought enters your mind, and the first thing that happens is a group of guards grab hold of it, <clears throat> and they throw it in this, this holding cell, and they interrogate it. They take it captive, and they interrogate it to find out what kind of thought is this? Is this a, a productive, holy, and good thought that's going to lead us into conformity with the will of God? Or is this a thought that's going to lead us into conformity with the world? And Paul says, as Christians, we're taking every thought captive. We don't just let our minds wander and think about anything and everything. No, we have intentional thinking. And those, those thoughts that have been, been grabbed and, and thrown into a holding cell and interrogated, like they're either going to be let loose and, and let to flourish in your mind, or they're going to be cast out. And so you have this century of guards that are, are standing, just waiting for any thought to dare approach your mind. Like, it's a really cool thought. You can control what you think about, or at least what you think on. And so here's Paul's admonition to you. Now, I want to jump to the end of verse 8, because all of, all of the qualities that we cover, we're going to come back to this thought at the end of verse 8. So he lists all these things, uh, what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute, excellent, anything worthy of praise. Let your mind dwell on these things. All right, so here's again, there's that difference. 
Let your mind dwell on these things. So we're not going to ask, what are the things that you randomly think about? We're going to ask, what are the things you choose to think about? What are the things that I let flourish in my mind, that I, that I run with? Those are the things that we need to be careful of. <clears throat> and so Paul says, all right, number one, whatever is true, let your mind dwell on the things that are true. And, and brethren, this is, this is challenging in today's world. All right. We typically trust people. Inherently, we trust people. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're immediately skeptical of everything you read and everything that you see on social media. But I think typically we trust people. We see, you know, some type of statistics uh, on social media. Not very many people are going to actually track down the source of those statistics and make sure that they're actually being represented properly. Like we just we inherently trust people. But we can we can be manipulated by that trust really easily. Like a set of statistics may say one thing, but people can use those statistics to say a lot of different things. Maybe some things that are misleading or maybe aren't completely true, but are, are half true. And if, if you really want to convince something of somebody that's false, give them you know, a half truth. Give them some truth in it along with all the falsehoods and people are much more likely to buy it. Uh, and usually people don't like to tell the entire truth because the entire truth would reflect, you know, negatively against their position. We just we just want to give people the, the side of the story that we want them to hear, our side of the story that makes us look good. And so we're wondering, you know, at the end of it all, when we're scrolling through social media and we're seeing all these opinions and all these ideas and people that are arguing back and forth and they have, uh, they, they all seem to be, you know, have valid ideas, we're left wondering, is there really any such thing as truth? Like, can we ever come to a realization of what truth is? Well, we've kind of found, fallen trapped to this whole postmodern movement, that there is no truth, and person A has their truth, and person B has their truth, and, and one is as good as the other. And it's just a lot easier. It's just a lot easier. And Paul is saying, let your mind find out if something is true. Be diligent to pursue those things that are true. Even if those things that are true violate what you've always believed. If it's true, brethren, grab hold of it and hold it. And if it means that you have to denounce things that you've believed before, so be it. But don't believe something because it's popular within our culture. Don't believe something because it makes you feel good or it seems right to you or that's the way that you think God should behave or act or speak. When you find something that is true, regardless of how it con conflicts or affirms your beliefs, hold on to it. Let your mind dwell on those true things. You know, and, and Jesus himself says in John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus believed that there was truth, there is truth, and that he held that truth. And, and in John 17, 17, as he's praying to the Father, he says, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Brethren, we need to be people that pursue and hold on to and love truth. Not just parts of truth that make our side of the story look good, but the whole truth. Because truth is a characteristic and quality of God. Uh, all right, moving on. We'll, we'll need to move somewhat quickly through these. So he says, whatever is true. Then he says, whatever is honorable, right? This is the idea of something that is, is worthy of respect or worthy of honor. What is our mind dwelling on? Honorable things or dishonorable things? All right. What are we letting our minds focus on? Uh, take a moment and think about the people in your life that you don't get along with. All right. Uh, maybe it's a family member. Uh, maybe it's a coworker. Uh, maybe it's a brother or sister in the church. Somebody that you don't really get along with. All right. What kinds of thoughts do you think about them? Well, are they true thoughts? And you're probably thinking, yeah, they're true. I know exactly what that person said. I know exactly what that person did. There's no two ways about it. I know, I know the truth. Okay, well, maybe that's that's fine. Maybe that is true, right? But are your thoughts about them respectful? 
can you be at odds with somebody, have a different understanding with somebody, and still be respectful? See, one of the ways we continue to justify fractured relationships in our lives is focusing on the mistakes that people make. And then we characterize and we define those people by their mistakes. And that justifies us in our position to be bitter against them, to be angry against them, to withhold forgiveness, whatever that train might lead to. Well, are we being honorable? Are we focusing on honorable things? Are we giving people respect? Are we letting them make mistakes? And recognizing that those mistakes happen, but choosing, choosing, brethren, this is, this is the crux of it all, choosing to focus on respectful thoughts about these people, the people that you don't get along with. See, we tend to play armchair quarterback a lot. Like that's the idea that, you know, you're watching a football game and, and you see somebody wide open down the field. And yet he throws it short to this guy who's under, you know, double coverage and you don't understand why. Uh, why didn't he throw it over? Because it's easy for you when you're completely separated from the high pressure environment and you have the advantage of seeing the entire field from the comfort of your home. Like you can maybe make better decisions. And we do this with all kinds of leadership in our world, right? We do this uh, with uh, our politicians, we do this with our boss. Uh, we even just do this with our friends and our family. We step back and we think, man, if, if I would have been that person, I would have made a different decision. I can't believe that they made that decision regarding such and such policy. Or I can't believe they made this decision based you know, on, on such and such law. And we, we feel like we have a better understanding or we're better equipped to make decisions than the people who are right there having to make them. And maybe sometimes we are. I'll even hand it to you. Sometimes we are. Most of the time, we don't have enough information. We think we can make the best decision, but we can't. Uh, and so don't dwell on people's mistakes. Right? People are doing the best they can with the tools that they have. And sometimes we just we make bad mistakes. We make bad decisions based on misinformation, based on a lack of information, or sometimes we're just based on selfishness. And we need to focus on what is good. Let people make mistakes. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, Peter says, Honor all men. Give them honor. Give them respect. Respect them as people who have been made in the image of God. Now, it might mean you don't, you don't have to agree with them on everything, but you can respect them. And we, we're kind of in this, this time in our, our society where if you don't agree with somebody, you don't have to respect them. And you can say horrible things about them and you can cut them out of your life because you disagree about gun control or immigration or health care or whatever political issue. We let those things divide us. Instead of realizing that people require and need respect, and God is calling us to respect one another, even if you disagree with them, it's still important because they've been made in the image of God, just like you and just like me. So whatever is honorable, let your mind dwell on that, not on people's mistakes. Thirdly, he says, whatever is right, let your mind dwell on whatever is right. Brethren, injustice abounds. It's all around us, right? We're in the midst of kind of a, a civil rights upheaval, but human trafficking has been going on forever. A huge, huge uh, social injustice. We have oppression in foreign governments. There's, there's injustice all around us. There's also injustice in your world. Maybe you didn't get the raise that you deserved or the promotion that you were in line for. Or maybe uh, the people around you aren't treating you right or, or giving you the respect that, that they should. Just like, you know, God is saying to have respect for one another. Well, maybe people aren't going to always respect you. 
And Paul is saying, he's not saying to ignore all those things. Don't, don't, don't hear me wrong. He's saying, don't let your mind be consumed by those things. When we let our mind be consumed by the evil in the world, it makes us forget the goodness of God. Right? The solutions to the world's problems are not more laws. The solutions are not better policies. The real solution to the world's problems is God. His will being played out in everybody's lives. Can you imagine if all, what, 7 billion people on this planet were strong, focused, faithful disciples of Jesus? There would be no need for all these laws. Like that, all of these laws would be completely useless because we would be treating people in such an amazing way. And so Paul says, let your mind dwell on the things that are right, not the things that are wrong. It's so easy to let our minds be consumed with the things that are wrong. And then we go around, we complain, and we, we're bitter, and we're angry. And that's all we can focus on. That's all that we let, and it just consumes us. And Paul says, focus on what's right. There's things that are wrong in the world. Okay, let's attack them. Let's deal with them. But let's not focus on them to where we lose sight of what is good in life and what is right. Christians should celebrate the things that are right in this world. Not just stand up against the evils of the world. I think we should do that too. But we should celebrate the things that are right. We should let our minds dwell on those things and draw people's attention to those things. Next he says, what is pure? Let your mind dwell on things that are pure. All right, this is from the same family of words that we get holy and sanctified and saint. Uh, remember at the very beginning uh, of chapter 1, Paul calls them saints, trying to elevate them and let them realize that they are holy and pure in the sight of God. The opposite of this word are, are things that are just common, plain, ordinary, worldly. Things that are not set apart and chosen and held special by God. That's, that's the difference. Things that are holy or pure have been cleansed and set apart by God. Versus things of the world are common. And so, how do you dwell on holy things? Well, I'd say that, let me just give you three easy ways to dwell on holy things. Number one, let your mind dwell on God. <clears throat> just, you know, sometimes think about God. And it doesn't have to be that you want to reach some strong you know, theological conclusion on, you know, divorce and remarriage or instrumental music or some heavy topic, just pause and think about the power and the holiness and the love of God. Just be quiet and contemplate those things. Let your mind dwell on God. It's okay to just shut out everything and be quiet and think about God. We don't always have to be doing something. We don't always have to be accomplishing something. Sometimes stopping and letting our hearts and minds be filled with the concept of God is accomplishing more than anything else would. So ways that we could dwell on holy things, just dwell on God. His nature, His personality, His love for you. Dwell on His Word. Right? Let Scripture infiltrate your mind. Not, not just read His Word. Dwell on it. Right? Maybe it's, maybe it's through memorizing Scripture. And it seems like the days of memorizing Scripture are, are, are kind of fading. But what a great way to plant the Word of God in our minds. Just memorize Scripture. Find passages that are encouraging and strengthening or challenging to your faith 
and memorize those passages so that they're constantly in your mind, in your mind. You've got some downtime at lunch, you're driving to work, you know, you're falling asleep at night. Just start rolling through scriptures that you have memorized and let God speak to you. What a great way to focus on things that are holy. If you're not really good at memorizing, well, maybe it'll just take more work, which is fine. Like there's no hurry. You're not trying to, to win any awards or make any you know accomplishments there. You're just trying to memorize. But also don't pass off the idea of meditating on God's word. I did uh, a series on the Christian disciplines a few years ago and and really kind of challenged myself on meditating and just stopping and, and reading a section of verses, two, three, four verses, reading them and then reading them again and praying about them and reading them again and reading them again and praying about them and reading them again and just sitting and letting them just bounce around just those passages that one or maybe it's just one verse just letting it really sink in it starts you start thinking about it in different ways you start applying it in different ways in your life just finding a quiet place and just stopping for 10 minutes 15 minutes and just letting God's word bounce around in your mind what a, what a tremendous practice uh, so how can we think on holy things or pure things? Think about God. Think about Scripture. Uh, let me throw a third one at you uh, in the form of song. One of the great ways that we remember things is by setting it to music, right? I, I know the words to gobs of Chicago songs. <laughs> I, and yet, when I compare that to, to things that I've tried to remember, that aren't necessarily set to music or entertainment. They're just some rote memorization, even memorizing scripture. Like I can, I can recite the, the lyrics and sing along with Chicago song, but I, I get halfway through a, a verse that I memorized a few years ago and I start stumbling. Why is that? I think God programmed us to, to have music be a source of, of stimulus for memory. And so take, take some of our hymns, Take some of our spiritual songs and memorize them. Sing them to yourself. A lot of our songs are just quotes from Scripture. They're just songs or Scripture that's been set to music. Let those songs just cycle in your mind. Sing them in your car. Sing them in your shower. Sing them just to yourself in your own mind. If you don't like singing out loud, just sing them in your own mind. A great way uh, to focus on what is pure. Uh, next, he says, to let your mind dwell on what is lovely. Right? That's kind of an interesting word, what is lovely. Uh, it's not really talking about something you know beautiful and attractive, but something that is characteristic of love. Like what, what promotes and produces love? That needs to be something that we focus on. It's easy. It is far too easy to let our minds focus on vengeance and revenge and anger and hatred and bitterness. Like, you know, and the list goes on. It is easy for some reason. I don't, I don't know why, and I, it's unfortunate, but it's easy for us to just dwell in that darkness. You know what I mean. Like, you know when you've gotten in that, that cycle of bitterness, and that's all you can think of, and it leads to anger, and that anger leads to bitterness, and that, that bitterness leads to unforgiveness, and that leads to more bitterness, and you're just, you're in this spiral of darkness. And it's easy. I don't know why it's easy, but it's, it's natural because we're in the flesh to feel those selfish feelings. It's hard, and it takes a lot of intention to think of things that are characteristic of love, right? You have to intentionally think about forgiveness. You have to intentionally think about kindness. You have to intentionally think about being a peacemaker, to be patient, to pursue unity. These are things that we have to stop the cycle of the darkness and let the light in and choose to let our minds focus 
on things that are characteristic of love, not of the darkness, but of the light. All right? This is a very intentional one. How, how, do you, how do you get rid of bitterness in your life? Bitterness is deep. And brethren, the answer is change what you think about. Change what you let sit and fester and blossom in your mind. And stop letting bitterness be that thing that you just let run free in your mind. It comes up in your mind, take it captive. Throw it in that holding cell, interrogate it, and then cast it out. And then replace it with forgiveness. And dwell on forgiveness. Dwell on patience. Let that be what surrounds you and focuses your mind on. Focus your mind on the good things. You have to decide to change the way you think. Or you'll just be stuck in that cycle of darkness next he says if anything is of good repute right so uh what what are the qualities of the people uh, of our society uh, of the faith that we hold in high regard right what is what is of good reputation in the people around us in our society in our faith? what is of good reputation let those things that are of good reputation Let's let our mind focus on those things. Focus on, on the people and the activities and the things of high reputation with God. Right? Think about for a minute, like how you spend your free time. Do you fill it with activities that are of high reputation or of low reputation? If, if the preacher and the elders went on vacation with you, would they have a good time? Or would they be embarrassed? If somebody in the world went with you on vacation, would they look at your faith and see that you're a, a true disciple of Jesus? Or would they look at your faith and think that you're a hypocrite? Like, what are we elevating? What are we dwelling on in our lives? The common mundane things of the world or things of high reputation, things that are held in high esteem by God. What are we choosing to focus on? Focus your mind on good things. He, he kind of wraps, uh, after this good repute section, um, he, he kind of goes on, he says, and, and if there's any excellence or if anything worthy of praise, as if to say, you know what, feel free to add to this list. Add anything that is excellent or worthy of praise. Let your mind dwell on those things. Anything that is you know, not excellent and not worthy of praise, anything that's of the world that is from selfish desires, don't let your mind dwell on those things. But anything else, feel free to expand this list. And as a matter of fact, just even fill your mind with deciding what to fill your mind with, uh, what good things you could fill your mind with. Let your mind dwell on excellent things. Let your mind dwell on things that are worthy of, of praise really gets to the heart of the matter all right find the good and focus on the good stop draining ourselves in the bad stop swimming in that that sea of, of negativity that just drives us draws us down and that might mean that we need to curb some of our input all right? it might mean that we need to curb some of the things that we watch on TV or the movies that we go to or the music we listen to or the feeds that we start reading on social media or you name it. Maybe we need to change the input in order to change the behavior. So brethren, let's be more critical of the TV we watch and the movie we watch and the social media we scroll through. Let's be a lot more critical onto what we put our minds to and dwell on. It seems as of late, when I scroll through Facebook, it is just negative after negative after negative. And if I spend 15, 20 minutes reading through posts that are just negative, I'm just, at the end of it all, I'm in a dark place. And I have to remind myself of the goodness of God and my, you know, 
my understanding of his love for me and his sacrifice for me, like I have to almost refresh myself on good things. It's just so easy to get drawn into the darkness and into the negative. Paul says in verse 9, like, look at these things. You learned them and you received them and you heard them and you saw them in me. <laughs> like, like, you hear all that? Like, these are the things that I taught you and, and you heard them and, and saw them and you received them and you applied them in your lives. And so Paul's saying, use me as an example. Here he's in prison. He could be focusing on his circumstances. He could be complaining and grumbling. He could be upset at the Romans and the Jews who are responsible for, for you know, him landing here and having to appeal to Caesar. You know, none of that would have happened if he would have just been allowed to preach the gospel freely and people didn't stick their nose in and start causing problems. I don't see that anywhere in Philippians because Paul chose to focus on what was right, what was pure, what was true, and what was lovely, what is of good repute. He chose to fix his mind on those things. All these other things are there. He can't help but know that they exist, but he chooses to dwell on the good things. And then the end of verse 9, we'll land the plane right here. Notice the result of changing the things that you think about. All right. Practice these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. Remember the peace that we talked about up in verse 7 that surpasses all comprehension, that is guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus? Well, here it is. The God of peace will be with you if you'll just start changing the things that you focus on, the things that you dwell on. It's easy to focus on the negative. It has an intentional effort to focus on that which is good. But as you lay your head down at night and you experience the peace of God, you'll find that it all makes sense. And you won't go to bed worried about the, the terrors of this world and all the evil and injustice of this world. We can go to bed. We can rest quietly knowing that God is our God. And that he provides this peace that passes all understanding. Let's pray. God, I admit that we get easily consumed with uh, dark things, evil things, bitterness and anger and jealousy and resentment. And Father, we're sorry, and I, I pray that you would open our eyes in those moments and just slap us out of it and help us to see that maybe we have been wronged and maybe there is an injustice in our world or in our lives, but give us the courage to approach it and attack it and to fix whatever we can, the best that we can. And God, help us to stop focusing on it. Stop continuing to think about it and dwell on it. Instead, Father, fill our minds with good, holy things. Fill our minds with you and your word. And I pray that we would learn to dwell on those things. But Father, we, we kind of get in the modes and we don't even know it. We don't even see it or recognize it. So open our eyes to those things and strengthen us in this battle. And we pray for it through the name of Jesus. Amen.